God bless you, everyone. I pray that all is well on this Wednesday, wonderful Wednesday. I pray that you are enjoying your day. I pray that all is well and that you are doing fine. I'm so grateful to God that we are able to come together again for word and power. Amen, amen. Today, beloved, our topic is humility. Humility. And I just want to let you all know to please don't forget to like and subscribe. Please do that for me. If you are enjoying the Word and Power, please subscribe to the channel. Like and subscribe, or just subscribe. Amen. Thank you. Just not just like and sub, not just um subscribe, but I pray that it's a blessing to you and for you. I pray that God is ministering unto you, and I'm truly thankful to God for being able to be able to to minister the Word of God. And listen, I do do my lives. At, um, on Monday, Wednesday, and on Friday. But mostly, if you go back and you're able to catch some of the lives, um, there, there are some lives that I have done. So I want you to be able to still catch them. I know that we have different time spans and uh, we're di in different parts of the world, but I truly pray that it's a blessing for you and to you. And to be very honest, I am late and I'm still working on that. So please be patient with me. Uh, the times that I'm trying to get back into doing are lives at 930 on Monday. And I just did one on prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for we had prayer. So I truly pray that you are able to catch those and that it will minister unto you. So listen, let's have a word of prayer, man. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for what you have done and for what you're going to do, God. Lord, we honor you, Jesus, and we love you so much, oh God. Heavenly Father, we ask right now in the name of Jesus, yes, God, that you would touch every heart and every mind this morning, God. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would heal those that are sick and afflicted right now in the name of Jesus, that you would touch and heal, Lord God, even their organs, oh God. Heal, Lord, in in the name of Jesus, those, oh God, rheumatoid arthritis, oh God, heal those, oh God, with tumors, oh God, on the brain, God. Lord, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that the healing power of God would work on their behalf, oh God, that you would heal those, oh God, with left epilepsy and muscular dystrophy, oh God. Lord, heal even those, oh God, in the name of Jesus, with Parkinson's disease, oh God. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus, yes, God, over the neurological system, oh God. I plead the blood of Jesus, yes, God, all throughout their body, God. I plead the blood of Jesus, yes, God, even throughout their limbs, oh God, their tendon and ligament and muscles, oh God. Lord, I come against tendonitis, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, I plead the blood of Jesus, yes, God, that you would regulate every nerve system in their body, God, that you would bring them back to normal right now in the name of Jesus, yes, God. Oh God, we plead the blood of Jesus for you on the far transgression and bruised by iniquities, oh God. Lord, the chastisement of our peace upon you and with your stripes he healed, oh God. Heal even right now, even those, oh God, with eye conditions and eye problems, oh God. Heal, Lord God, even those, oh God, with cataracts, oh God. Heal right now, even those with cancer of the eyes, oh God. Those, oh God, in the name of Jesus, yes, God, with strained muscles, oh God, upon their pupils, Lord Jesus, upon their pupils, oh God, upon their eyes, oh God. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would heal right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. Oh God, I plead the blood of Jesus over their vision right now, God. Lord, we know, Lord God, that you're able to do it, God. We believe that you're able to do it, God. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus right now, God. Lord, touch even those, oh God, in their Lord Jesus bloodstream, oh God. Those, oh God, with intestinal problems, oh God. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, oh God, touch their intestines, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Heal, Lord God, like only you can, like only you will, God. Lord, let your blood run through their blood, God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, remove all contamination, God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, heal their intestines, oh God. Heal, Lord Jesus, their ovaries and their kidneys. And Lord God, heal even right now the men's, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, their manly parts, oh God. Heal right now in the name of Jesus, yes, God, hallelujah. Oh, the blood of Jesus on their pancreas, oh God. The blood of Jesus, yes, God, on their backs, oh God. The blood of Jesus all over their body, all over their organs, oh God. The blood of Jesus over those, oh God, hallelujah, that are suffering with alopecia, God. Lord, restore and heal their follicles, oh God, their hair follicles in their head, oh 
oh God. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would cause their hair to grow again, God. Oh, the blood of Jesus, yes, God, touch and heal right now, God. Even those, oh God, in their mental state, oh God, touch right now in the name of Jesus. Bring their minds back, oh God, in the name of Jesus, yes, God. Oh God, touch and give their mind, oh God, peace and right condition and order, oh God. Give them right understanding, God. Lord, give them value and give them worth, oh God. Lord, I pray for strength for our pastors, oh God. I pray, God, that you would strengthen and hold their arms up, oh God. I pray that they would not throw in the towel, Lord God. Oh God, at least not yet, oh God. I pray in the name of Jesus for you to give power to the faith, oh God. And then to have no might, you increase of strength, oh God. Lord, touch right now in the name of Jesus, yes, God. Oh, bless your name, our ministers and deacons and elders and missionaries, oh God. Lord, touch, oh God, our ushers, oh God. Touch every lame of her right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over them and over their house, oh God. Over their families, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Touch even those that are not saved, oh God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, fill them with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, oh God. Lord, touch their mind right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Let them know they're beloved of you, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lord, you don't like the sin, God, but you love them, oh God. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, for God so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in you should not perish for everlasting life. Lord, in the name of Jesus, strengthen them today, God, in the name of Jesus. Move, oh God, every situation, oh God, of adversity all around them, oh God. Move the spirit, oh God, of contention and strife, oh God. Oh God, anxiety and stress, oh God. Lord, we come against that spirit of anxiety right now. We bind it in the name of Jesus, and we send it back to the hand of the sinner. I command peace in your mind, peace in your soul, peace in your heart, in the name of Jesus. I command deliverance over spirits, oh God, erasing thoughts, oh God, of uncertainty and fear, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Yes, God, the mindedness, oh God. Lord, give their mind clarity and peace right now, in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, God, for this is the day which the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you will bless each and every household financially, oh God, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Strengthen, oh God, Michelle's family, oh God. Strengthen, oh God, even those who are grieving today, God. Oh God, comfort them in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lord, I bless you and I honor you. I praise you for all that you have done, all that you're going to do, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your holy name, O oh God. Satan, you are defeated right now in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus, it is against you on every side, on every hand. In the name of Jesus, we command victory today, God. In the name of Jesus, we count victory all throughout this week. In Jesus' name, I command in the name of Jesus, healing throughout their mind, body, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name, bless this word today, God. Lord, God, use me as an instrument of your peace. And Lord, God, you get the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name name. Amen. Well, beloved, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So glad that you could join me on Word and Power. So today we're talking about humility. What does the word humility mean? Well, it means recognition of one's true position before God. Recognition of one's true position before God. And that means that when you're in a state of humility, the state of humility does not cause you to, to look down on yourself as though you have no value and that you have no worth and that you cannot walk in the confidence of God. It means that you understand that God is supreme ruler, he's supreme authority, and he's God all by himself and besides him, there is no other. And so what that means is that we submit to him, we surrender to him, we stand in awe of him, we worship him in what spirit and in truth. The scripture says, they that worship him, worship God, must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth, because God is a what? He is a spirit, amen? And so in order to do that, we have to recognize that he is the supreme being, he is the supreme Lord amen over all and so he is the creator of the ends of the earth and so by us recognizing that that we understand that we are not greater than him the scripture says and greater works than these shall we do why because he went unto the father he took another form of himself and he goes back to being thank you jesus being back on the throne 
while at the same time he's ruling between he's ruling over heaven and earth so beloved when we understand that we understand that we are not greater than god that's what got satan kicked out of heaven why because satan wanted to be like the most high in ezekiel thank you jesus in the book of ezekiel i believe it's in 28 and so we have to understand and recognize that no one is greater than God, that God is God all by himself. And so we must worship him in what spirit and in truth and understand that he is great, that he is omnipotent, he's all powerful, he's omniscient, he's all knowing, he's omnipresent, he's all presence. And so understand that also he is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. And so by us understanding that, we have to be in a place of what? Surrender unto God. So where does the word humility come from? It comes from humble. It comes from being what? Humble, the word humble. And what does the word humble mean? It means modest. It means meek. It means having a proper sense of one's worth. It means not proud and what? Not arrogant. Not proud or arrogant. Because when a person is um has pride in them or the spirit it, the past tense of being prideful or having pride means being proud okay and so when a person is proud they are they have a conceited sense of one's worth and in that that spirit of being proud there is a spirit of what haughtiness haughtiness means arrogance so then it means oh arrogance means over overbearing pride and it means presumption that means you walk around presuming that you are great and acting in that in that manner that you're acting without consulting god for his opinion and for his direction and for his instruction and so we and so that that spirit of presumption that means that you are full of self amen and so you, it's very important that you understand and know that being humble is not a bad thing. Humble does not mean that people get to, um, you, it may make you think that people are walking all over you and making you feel degraded, making you feel less than. Beloved, the scripture lets us know that there's a time to speak and then there's a time to keep silent. And so what does that mean? There's a time when we're able to what express how we feel. It says the scripture says speaking the what the truth in love. So that when we speak the truth in love, being and being able to communicate effectively what it is that you want to say respectfully, amen, and knowing the right time to do it. In the book of James, it talks about the first chapter, and it talks about, I believe it's around the 19th verse. 18 to 19 verse and it says being swift to hear that means being what swift being quick to what listen to hear so when a person is trying to hear they're trying to what understand so it says being swift to hear being quick being quick to what to hear to listen to understand and then slow to speak that means you're not being quick to what to speak that means you're being quick to what to hear so that you can get an understanding and then what slow to what speaking slow to responding why because you want to be able to give an answer a correct answer and an answer that is in wisdom the scripture says that he that handles the matter wisely shall find good he that handles a matter wisely shall find good so we all want to be in that place and that takes humility it means that i have to humble myself that means that i can't presume or to assume that i have the answer right away or to act like that i'm always right all of the time amen because when a person acts like they're right all of the time that means that they are not leaving room for god to give them instruction and so you have to always be in the mode of having a teachable spirit that means a spirit that is willing to listen to learn from god and to get god's what direction how to handle situations because we don't always know how to handle situations amen so i want to talk to you from the book of second kings the fifth chapter and it talks about and it's in the old testament and it's right behind first kings and it talks about and i want to be able to give you the writer of the book of first kings 
Now, the writer of First Kings, it is dealing with a time when the kingdom is now split. And because it is split, it is going into, because Solomon has now died. And so now we have different kings that are taking um, the role of being kings. And so what's happening is the kingdom is split because Jeroboam and because of Solomon. And because, I want to say, excuse me, uh, Jeroboam and Roboam, which is the son, Roboam is the son of Solomon. And so when 10 parts of 10 tribes were promised unto Jeroboam, Jeroboam decided not to wait. And he caused the children of Israel to basically go into a direction of serving false gods and Baal and um, burning incense and dealing with uh, witches and enchantments and so forth. And so he caused, he provoked the Lord to jealousy, extreme jealousy by their abominations. And he was the cause of that. Here it is, Roboam, which was the son of Solomon. Solomon's son, Roboam, is now the successor after his father has died. And so what happens is because he decided to listen to the younger men instead of listening to the elders. The kingdom got split. And so here it is, we're in Samaria. And so Samaria, and so God, when they started turning away from God increasingly and started serving other gods and burning incense and doing all kinds of abominations before God, God put them into, he delivered them into the hands of their enemies. So this is what we're seeing here. And so Elijah is now being, is now caught up. And here it is, the ministry of Elisha is now taking place in the times of the book of Kings, of Second Kings. And so here it is, Naaman, who is the captain of the host of Syria. And I want to be able to break that down because he is the captain. What does that mean? That means that he is a higher official in the ranking of the army of Syria. He is the captain. He is basically next in line to the king. And so he works very closely with the king. And so he goes out, he fights the battles and so forth, and he brings them a win or he brings them a lose. Here it is because the children of Israel had sinned against God and they refused to listen to the voice of God and to really listen to his, his prophets that he's sending to them. God delivers them into the hand of their captives. And it just so happens that Israel, because there was a tribe of Judah, Judah is now separated from Israel because what's happening now is that Israel is falling in the sins of Jeroboam. And so those that are following Judah are now in a place where God is giving them a choice to be. So remember, because when the children of Israel, we understand that he is the captain of the host of what? Of the king of Syria. So that means he is the captain of the army. That's what the word host means. It means the army, a large army, and it means that to entertain. But in this context, it means that he is the captain of what? Of the army of the king of Syria. So he's working right alongside the king, just like the United States works alongside the generals in the armies. And so here it is, he is a great man with his master. So not only is he a captain over a large army, he is also, he also has a master over him. So he's a captain, he's a ruler over the army of Syria, but also he is under leadership. So he's in leadership, but he's also under leadership. And so here it is, and it says a great man with his master and honorable. That means he's respected. He is given honor or glory. Okay, and it says, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And what happens here? The Lord gave into uh, the children of Israel into the hands of their captives and in order to save them alive. And he did that because when they sinned against him in committing abominations, he gave them a choice, either go into captivity or stay in the land and die. And so here it is. God is allowing them to be delivered into the hand of what? Syria. And it is by 
the hand of Naaman that that God is basically God is he's allowing Naaman to capture Israel okay and to bring them into slavery okay to save them a lot but here it is he was also a mighty man of valor so we see a couple of things he is the captain of the host of the king of Syria he's a great man with his master he's an honorable and also he is what a mighty man of valor the word valor means bravery it means heroism that means he's a hero why because he's captured the children of Israel now they he didn't just capture them God gave them into his hands and so he's getting the honor because of that and so here it is the Syrians and the Syrians had gone out in by companies and it says and had brought away captive meaning into slavery or bondage they had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid meaning a little girl here is this little girl she is now serving Naaman's wife Naaman's wife is her mistress mistress meaning a married woman it also means a woman of authority and here it is she's serving her what her mistress which has authority over her because now she's enslaved she is in bondage she's carried away captive or into slavery into bondage out of the land of her nativity which is Israel okay and she is now serving name his wife not only is he now remember this the scripture I failed to say this he was also a mighty man of valor but he was a leper now he has all of this under his belt but he's a leper and also he is married how can you imagine that he's married because leprosy in the book of Leviticus leprosy can be contagious leprosy can be dry it can be wet also leprosy can be on some parts of the body and on um i remember when jesus healed the man that had leprosy his hand had leprosy he healed the man okay and he told him to take out his hand amen when somebody tried to attack jesus and he i believe in the scriptures it says that his hand turned to leprous and god healed him here it is in this particular because there are different types of leprosy there's wet and then there's dry and so here it is and the Assyrians in verse 2 we're in 2nd Kings the fifth chapter 2nd Kings the fifth chapter and we're on the second verse and the Syrians had gone out and the Syrians had always made war with the children of Israel from time to time and they come from Laban Laban was the Syrian remember that Jacob married who who was it that he married he married Leah and he also married Rachel he served for Rachel but he really got Leah because Leah was the oldest and so he just served her for seven years and then he served seven more years because he thought he was getting Rachel but he got Leah so here it is we understand as we continue that he is now in a place where he has leprosy now can you imagine He's married and got leprosy. And all of this, he's an honorable man. He's a captain of the host of the king of Syria. He's also a great man with his master. And he's a valiant, a valiant man. That means he's a brave man. He's a hero to them. But he has leprosy. And then it says, and, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Okay? And she said, now this is the little maid, and she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now the word recover means, I just, I want to say this, recovery means to heal or to make well. So what's happening is, he is in a state where he has this leprosy, okay, and it's, it can be contagious. So he has to be careful whatever he touches because it can become what? Infected. So here it is. He has all of these accolades and he's he's all of this. And so he is the captain of the army of the king of Syria. But yet he's a leper. My God, my God. And here it is. He is the, it's, it's, when we think about this, humility is a position of the will because remember you're made of body soul and spirit so your soul 
it deals with your emotions, it deals with your decisions, it's where your decisions lie, and it also deals with your heart as well. And so here it is, it's a position of the will. And in order to humble yourself and to be a person of humility, you have to be willing to yield to authority, to obey another's will. That's what submission is. It means yielding to authority, obedience to another's will. And to submit means to yield to governance or authority. That means you have to be willing to what submit to what those that are in authority. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And even when they're not doing right, thank you, Jesus. That's a whole nother subject. When they're not doing right, then you go to God. And God is able to make a way of escape in the time. Now, if it's something that's causing you to violate your principles and your conduct and your, your convictions, that is something that we do not. We, we have a conviction. So the conviction is, I can't violate my conviction. And God is able to make a way of escape when you do not have to do what? Violate your conviction. So here it is. A master is one who has authority over another. A host is one who entertains a large army and multitude. Valor means bravery. It means heroism. And so here it is. God used his name, the captain of the host, like I said before, to capture and to lead away captives, some of the people of Israel. Now, this leprosy is a disease. It causes a loss of sensation. It can cause muscle paralysis. It can cause you to be paralyzed and deformities. Miriam, when she spoke against Moses because he married the Ethiopian woman, God called Miriam, Aaron, and Moses out of the tent. And he wanted to speak to them in the doorway of the tent. And what happens? He tells her, well, why weren't you afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And here what he does is he smotes her, smites her with leprosy. She's out of the camp for seven days. They could not travel for seven days. Why? Because of Miriam talking against um, Moses. Here it is. And I thought about that. Why didn't he chastise Aaron? That's a whole other subject. Thank you, Jesus. And here lepers were considered unclean or contagious and incurable in some instances. And oftentimes hereditary in 2 Samuel 3 29 and excludes them from the camp in Leviticus 22 2 to 4. So here it is this little maid, a young girl, she waits on Naaman's wife. And the word mistress means a married woman, it also means a woman with authority. Okay, so she wants to see him what recover, she wants to see him healed. So the word recover means to restore lost things. It means to become well. So she wants him to become well, but she wants him to become what? I say heal. Why? Because he has this leprosy. And so it's it's something that you also, you have to be careful not to touch anything that he has touched, that he has come in contact with. Amen. So he, so that must have made him feel somewhat isolated on the inside. It probably made him feel less than, my God. But if you notice here, because of his accolades and because of his position, beloved, can I be real with you? You got to be careful if you're not a person that is humble, but you're lifted up in pride and arrogance. And remember what I said, in pride, there is a haughtiness. Haughtiness means arrogance. It means overbearing um pride and it also means it means to have presumption so when a person is full of a conceited sense of their value and their worth that's a scary place because then nobody can really talk to you and so god has to humble you just like he had to do nebuchadnezzar when nebuchadnezzar had that dream and nebuchadnezzar got beside himself at the ending of that dream because remember he was like the beast of the field Thank you, Jesus. And he had cl beer claws. And he also was eating grass. And he had hairs growing out of his body like, like the beast. My God, my God. And so he was eating grass. Can you imagine for seven years eating grass like an animal? God has different ways of humbling us when we fail to listen to the voice of God and we keep going in our own strength, thinking it's by our own might, by our own power, by our own wisdom, by our own education that we have arrived and we have gotten 
you know, the finer things in life. You have to be careful. You have to remember the scripture says in Deuteronomy 8 and 18, he says, be real lest thou forget the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his what his covenant or his agreement in the earth. Amen. So that his agreement was to be able to fund what the vision of the gospel, the kingdom of God. So you got to be careful when God blesses you that you don't get high minded and lifted up in pride and arrogance and thinking that it's by my might and my power that I've done these things. And that's one of the things that happened with Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. So what takes place in Naaman's situation as we continue to read, her desire was to see her, her leader or to see her, her master which was her mistress's husband, to see him heal, okay? And she called him Lord. Now, he must have been treating her white right for her to have that compassion, that concern, and that that love. I want to say that, that care for him, that she didn't want to see him like this, in this condition, with this disease. And so here it is. She said in verse 3, she said unto her maidens, her, her mistress, she's talking to her, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. Who was the prophet? Elisha. For he would recover him of his leprosy. And when one went in and told his Lord, saying, now somebody overheard her speaking to the mistress, which was named his wife, saying, thus and thus said the maid or the young girl that is of the land of Israel. Okay. And the king of Syria, because he loved him also, and he cared about him. He was concerned about him, because remember, he was a great man with his master in verse 1. Here it is, the king of Seir said, go, to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. Here it is, he's writing a letter to the king of Israel. And also, whenever you are going to, to another nation or under another kingdom or under another domain of a king, you always gave them gifts and presents because what you're doing is you're entreating them with kindness and with gifts so that you can get favor with them so that whatever you were asking or requesting of them, they wouldn't have a problem with giving it to you. So this is what he's doing. So he's respecting him being the king of another what nation. And so what happens here, the king of Syria said, go to, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and he left and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of clothes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, now, now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Basically, the king didn't have the power, the authority to heal him. It was the prophet Elisha. And so that's basically what he wanted. And so here it is, the king took it the wrong way. He's thinking that the king of Syria is thinking that he's in God's stead and that he can heal him and make heal and make alive. So this is where the statement comes. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes. He tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive? He's thinking that he's taking it the wrong way because the letter is really for Elisha. He said, this man doth sin unto me. Now notice how he doesn't recognize him as king. He says, and this man, that this man doth sin unto me to recover a man of leprosy, to heal a man of leprosy. Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel or seeking a dispute against me. He thought that he was picking a fight with him. He thought that he was trying to come against him and try to, you know, make war against him. And so here it is. He, is, he begins to go on to say, and at that time, I want to be able to say who the king was. Thank you, Jesus. Jehoram. Jehoram. And so here it is. I'm going to get that wrong. You have to forgive me. This lighting is very bad. Jehoram. Yes. Okay. And so here it is. 
that the king is thinking that he wants to wake war against them, but that wasn't what it was. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard the king of Israel. Now see, here it is, Elisha's telling him, he says, send him unto me. Because basically, he doesn't have the power because back in that day, when they would inquire of the Lord, they would use the prophets to inquire for them of the Lord. If they need, if they went into battle, if they need to get an answer from God, why? Because they, the prophet, would be able to tell them what thus saith the Lord when they were called by God. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had tore his clothes, rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, "Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes?" He's asking the question, "Why are you tearing your clothes?" He said, "Let him come now to me." And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, Elisha was not acting in proud and arrogance. He knew that he was called by God. He didn't want the king to concern himself, the king of Israel, to concern himself with this matter. Because he wanted him to know there's a prophet in Israel. But he wasn't tooting his horn. Now, arrogance and confidence is two different things. He was walking in the area of confidence because God was with him. And he knew that God was with him. And he knew that he was going to do what? Speak by the authority of God. Not speaking on his own accord, but speaking by the authority of God. And here it is. God had given him the power and the enforcement to be able to tell him what to do to cause his healing to come forth. Here it is. So Naaman came with his what? Horses and with his chariots and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of the Elisha. Now here it is, he needs Elisha to, to ask God to heal him, but yet he comes with his horses and his chariot. Now basically he's coming to him, but he's still coming to him in the spirit of what? Pride and in the spirit of arrogance. Why? Because he is what? He's a mighty man. He's a great man with his master. He's the captain of the host of what? The king of Syria. He's an honorable man. Okay. The only way that he's honorable is because God allowed him to capture uh, Israel. Some of them take some of them into captivity. And also he is what? A hero to them. The word valor means bravery and it means heroism, which comes from the word hero. And so here it is is that Naaman comes to him. Now, can you imagine him coming to him with his horses in his chair and standing up like, okay, I want you to come out to me because I'm a great man. So you need to come out to me and recognize me and honor me. Doesn't that remind you of how in the book of Esther, how Haman was with Mordecai every time Mordecai would come past because he had just gotten promoted he wanted, and so the king, king, king had your ears, told them to bow down before him. But because he was a Jew, Mordecai was a Jew, he didn't bow down to anybody but God. And that's because he was not supposed to bow down to anybody other than the Lord God Almighty. Because he was a Jew and he recognized God as being who he was, the Lord Jehovah and being God to him. And so in their custom, they did not, the Jews did not bow down to any other king because bowing down to another king was like idolizing another king. It means you're giving honor to every other king other than the true and living God that brought them out of what? Brought them out of 400 years of slavery. And so here it is, Haman got upset with Mordecai and Haman wanted to kill all of the Jews because of Mordecai because he couldn't lay his hands on him. Long story short, the king gets wind of it, okay? And God allows him to, to deliver Mordecai out of the hand of what? Haman. Here it is, Haman's thinking that when uh, Esther invites them to dinner, okay, after she'd been fasted for three days and had the Jews fast for her, because here it is, he sets out to pay money and he seals with he seals it with the king's ring. He puts a contract out on the Jews to have the Jews killed. And so at a certain period of the day or a certain period of time or on a date, they would kill all the Jews. And that's because he was angry with Mordecai because Mordecai would not bow down to him because he didn't recognize 
his position, his new position of being second in command, being promoted. Here it is. The king has no idea all of this is going on. And prior to all of this, this is why Esther was made king so that she could save her people from Haman because God knew that Haman's heart was not right. And this is as a result way back when, when God told Saul to kill up all the Amalekites. And when he didn't, as a result, Haman is a product of him not being killed because his ancestors kept some of them alive. And now here it is. He's now risen up and he now wants to what, annihilate the Jews because of Mordecai. Okay. And as we continue, long story short, if I can condense it, here it is. Mordecai refuses to recognize him. He refuses to bow down to him. And so it infuriates Mordecai. And many of you have people around you like that, that are angry because they want you to bow down and, and, and honor them. And here they treat you maliciously. They, tr they mishandle you. They mistreat you. They abuse their power and their authority. Amen. And so here it is. God sets it up where the king could not sleep that night. Because he could not sleep, he, he, it was found out that he, Mordecai basically saved the king's life. And so two of the king's chamberlains who had wanted to do harm to the king, Mordecai told on them. And what it was is that they told it to Esther and Esther sealed it with the king's ring and it was found out. And so they dealt with them and they were killed. And so here it is, it was found out. And just before all of this could take place, we can go into the king to talk about killing Mordecai. Here it is, God has it placed. He has it fixed where he couldn't sleep and he finds this out and he wants to honor Mordecai. What a, oh my goodness, can you imagine having to honor somebody that you felt was underneath your foot, somebody that you felt was less than you, somebody that you thought should honor you and bow down to you, but here it is, the tables turn, and here it is, Haman was going into the king to speak to him, okay? And as he was on his way to speak to him about Mordecai, here is the king wanted to honor the man that did this great deed for him in saving his life. And it was all because Esther had sealed it with the king's ring. And it was found out that she recorded that it was Mordecai that told on him. And so here it is. Haman's thinking, okay, as the king, before Haman could talk and get it out of his mouth, he says to the, the king says to him, he says, who was out in the court? And they said, Haman. He said, have him come in. He tells him to come in. He said, what should be done unto this man whom the king delighted to honor? Now here in his mind, he's puffed up and arrogant, thinking, oh, this is how you should do it. Now all the while, he's thinking of how he would like to be king and how he would like to be honored as king. Okay. He says, okay, put on the king's royal apparel. He said, also have him ride in the king's chariot and also have, you know, everybody parade him around and honor him. And so he's thinking that this is all going to be for him because he's thinking to himself, who would the king delight to honor more than to myself? He said, okay, and put on the king's. Now you don't went so far. You want the king to put his crown royal upon your head. Oh my goodness, people are so outlandish because they're so full of arrogance and pride. And so that God has to humble you. God has to humiliate you. That's the only way I can say it. Because when you get to a place where you get so pious and so lifted up in your arrogance and in your pride that you think that you are the one that is living on your own. You are the one causing yourself to breathe. You are the one that is um, causing yourself to to have all the riches and the wealth. You think that you're the one, the doer, that is allowing this to happen and that you are the one that has all power in your hand to do this and to do that. And you got yourself this car and you are able to do this for your loved ones. Beloved, humility, humility is what God wants. He wants us to be humble. He doesn't want us to be puffed up and proud and arrogant. Here it is. When Haman had to walk, when, when the king said this, he said, okay, everything that you just said, 
he would not put the throne of the um, crown upon his head. He said, everything else you can do. He said, but you're going to do it to Mordecai. When he had to do that to Mordecai, do you not know that was the most humiliating moment for him? You know why? Because anytime you exalt yourself and lift yourself up, God will humble you. The scripture says in the book of Proverbs, it says, pride goes before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. Why? Because when a person gets lifted up in arrogance, God has to humble them. And it's only a matter of time because pride goes before what? You being destroyed. That means your destruction is following you. It's going to follow you when you, it's going to follow you, that spirit of pride. So in other words, when a person gets prideful or has a spirit of pride, um, a proud heart, that means that that's, that destruction is going to follow. And that means when they get haughty, that means that that fall is going to come very shortly thereafter. You want know why, beloved? Because God doesn't want us to have a spirit of pride and arrogance. He wants us to have a spirit of humility. And when you're humble, humbleness does not mean that you're weak. It means that you're strong. It means strength under control. That means when you want to get at somebody, you don't get at them, but you think it through and you think in your mind because you're strategic and you're trying to think of the wisest way through Christ Jesus how to handle that person. And that's why it's important that you pray on the inside, that God gives you guidance and direction. It's important that you stay before God in prayer, that you seek the face of God and that you humble yourself. Why? Because everyone that would exalt himself shall be abased. Here it is. We think about in the book of Luke, I believe it is. There were two men. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 18 and 14. And I just want to read a little bit of that because it said, everyone that exalts himself should be abased and everyone that obeys himself should be exalted. Here there was a publican and there was also, I believe it was a Pharisee. The Pharisee, there were two men praying and as they prayed, the Pharisee said, he stood and prayed with himself. He said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. A publican is what a tax collector, or they call them a sinner. He said, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess, all that I own. He said, and the publican, that that was his prayer, the Pharisees' prayer, because remember the Pharisees kept the laws of Moses in the time of Jesus. And it says here, and the publican standing, afar off, would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. You know why he did that? He wanted God's mercy because he felt unworthy. He's saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. My God, my God. You know what he was doing? He was humbling himself. He was lowering himself before the Lord. He was submitting and yielding unto God. You know how you get God's attention? Yield yourself unto God. Each time you yield yourself to God, God can use a person that is humble quicker than he get can somebody's pride that's prideful. When a person is humble, he doesn't have to cause you to go through um, the degrading process quicker than a person that is proudful, okay, or lifted up in one's own sense of conceitedness or an arrogance or an haughtiness. You know why? Because you're already at that place where you're already saying, God, I surrender. When you surrender to God, surrendering to God, you have to surrender to God through obedience. When a person obeys God, they're yielded to God. They're surrendered unto God. And so God can speak to you more and get more out of you when you're humble rather than he does when you're prideful. And what happens when a person, because when a person is prideful, God has to beat you down. He has to strip you down. He has to take everything that is valuable to you. Why? Because you're so, because when a person is lifted up in pride or arrogance and also a person that is stubborn and rebellious because also in there is not just pride but stubborn and rebellious and self-willed and 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 arrogant and refusal to listen and very defiant 
and very disobedient. God has to humble you. Why? Because when you refuse to yield to God, God has to break your will. God has to break that spirit of stubbornness. He has to break that because stubbornness is the sin of what witchcraft. In other words, you're, you're refusing to yield to God. And so when you refuse to yield to God, God got to break you. And when God breaks you, it's not a pleasant feeling. It's not a it's not a joyous feeling. Feeling It doesn't look great. It doesn't feel great. It's, it's, it's hurtful. And oftentimes it makes you feel like God doesn't love you. But it, it's not that he doesn't love you. He just wants you to yield to him, to surrender to him. And he doesn't want to use these methods to be able to do it, beloved. So when a person is humble, when they walk in the spirit of humility and they have a, a, a proper sense of one's worth and proper sense of who God is. That means that they recognize that he is almighty God. They recognize and they reverence him. They fear him. They will, they stand in awe of him. When a person stands in awe of God, God does not have to um, break them down like he does with somebody that is refusing to listen to the voice of God. The person that is what? Defiant. A person that is set in their ways and they think that their way is right and nobody else's way is right. Amen. Everybody else's way is wrong. Because remember, God had to do Nebuchadnezzar like this. He had to humble him. Who else did he have to humble? There were times that he had to humble David when with Bathsheba. And God, thank you, Jesus, because he had had a man killed. And so God had to humble him to let him know, even though you're king, you still have to be faithful. You still have to be righteous before me. You still have to be a man of integrity before me. Why? Because I put you on that throne and you don't have the right to misuse and abuse your authority and to take what belongs to someone else. Amen. And he got exposed by who? By Nathan the prophet. Here it is. Naaman. Thank you, Jesus. So what he's saying here. He says, I tell you this, this is Jesus talking, this man went to his house justified. That means to declare one is not being what guilty and being righteous before God. He said, I, he said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be ex ex abased and everyone and he that humbleth himself shall be what exalted. What does it mean? To exalt oneself. To exalt means to rise or to lift up. It means the state of being raised up. To abase means to degrade. It means to humiliate. And so here it is. He's saying the publican. He said this man went away justified rather than what? The Pharisee. And the Pharisees, they, they, they were known for keeping the laws of Moses. But God is saying... He's saying, this man, when he humbled himself, he smote his chest. He said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sin. That means, Lord, have pity, have compassion upon me because I'm a sinner. He recognizes that he is not worthy. He recognized that he was a sinner and that if it had not been for what? For God, my God, thank you, Jesus, where would he be? So as we go back, here it is that he's now in, he's now in a state where he comes with his chariots. He comes with his horses, standing at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha, Elisha's not impressed. Elisha's not, he's not impressed by his chairs, his horses, or by his position. Because here, this man is a leper, and he needs help. So if you need help from somebody, and you refuse to humble yourself and ask for the help, it's no fault of anybody else but your own beloved. You know why? Because you got to humble yourself. Anytime you need help from somebody, you can't come with the spirit, well, are you going to help me or not? You know, I need this or I need that, beloved. You know why? Because you're refusing to humble yourself because you feel that that's the approach that you need to use. And with that approach, when you come with that type of approach, people are not willing to help you. They will more or less not help you. So having a spirit of humility is very important. So here it is. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. Elisha's like, okay. He said, I'm going to send a messenger unto you saying, go. He sends a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times and your flesh shall come again to thee and thou shall be clean. Now here seven is completion. Now here it is. He just given him a simple instruction. 
But here it is, Naaman, he was raw. The word raw comes from the word wrath. So that word means that it is indignation. It means strong anger and indignation. Here it is, he didn't got in his flesh. He's angry because he feels like I'm a captain of the host of the army of what? Of um, Syria. You know, I'm a, I'm a valiant man. I'm a man of value, uh, a brave man. You know, I'm an honorable man. And so he goes away angry. In strong anger, he went away and said, Behold, I thought that's the problem. Because when people think that they are so high and mighty and lifted up in self that everybody should come down to their level. Everybody should bow down to them. And they're the ones in need. They're the ones that need the help. They're the ones that are seeking what provision. And they're the ones that need. When you're in a place where you need God, beloved, you have to come like a child. He says, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such as what? The kingdom of heaven. That means when you need something from God, you got to come before God like a child. That means you can't come self-righteous. You can't come in your arrogance, coming like, you know, um, I'm bad, big and bad. And, you know, do you know who I am? You're standing before the king, beloved. You're standing before Almighty God. And oftentimes when you get that mindset, God has to humble you to let you know, wait a minute, I'm God. My God, my God. Here it is. He said, he, he, he thought in himself. He said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. In other words, I thought he would come out to me and call on the name of, and stand and call on the name of his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper and recover me, the leper. Okay. Here it is. How foolish was he to think that, that he was that important. First of all, Lish was probably thinking, I ain't touching that leper, <laughs> you know, but Elisha, Elisha didn't do that. He's saying, go, he gives him a simple instruction. How many of us, beloved, God gives us a simple instruction and we refuse to listen to the simple instruction because we keep doing things our own way and we keep getting it wrong every time. It's not until we surrender unto God, beloved, and humble ourselves. He said in my people, which called my name, in 2 Corinthians 2 and 20, he said in 2 Corinthians, thank you, Jesus, chapter 20, if my people which are called my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins and heal their lands. Why? God wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you and set you free. God wants to give you his best. But until you humble yourself, he can't do it, beloved. It's going to be there and it's going to be delayed. Why? Because God wants the that part of you that is submitted and surrendered and yielded to him. Anytime God uses a vessel to do his will, to do his work, you got to be yielded unto God. You got to be surrendered unto God. Here it is. We're going to wrap this up. The scripture says in verse 12 that he's telling him, now you, you're the one that's the leper. You're the one with the skin condition that is contagious and it can, all, it can paralyze you too. He says, are not a banner and far par?" rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. Now here it is. He's still arrogant. He's still being lifted up. My God. He said, may I not, he said, waters of Israel, may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now he done went from wrath, strong what? Strong anger and indignation. And he's now telling him what waters are better for him to what? To, to dip in. Now here it is. He's a prophet. And he's a prophet sent by God, ordained by God, confirmed by God. And he hears God. And here he's trying to tell him what's best. Beloved, how many of us have tried to tell God, okay, God, I know this is best for me. And we get it wrong every time. Beloved, until you humble yourself, you're going to keep going around in circles and you're not going to get it right until you yield yourself to God and do it God's way. God is not telling you to do 
You know, the things that we think are hard are really not that hard, but it's hard because we refuse to yield and to surrender to the voice of God. And that means we're going to get it wrong every time. And that's why God has to humble us and humbling us. We don't like humbling because humbling hurts. Humbling makes us feel like, God, you're hurting, you're breaking me. I don't like how this feels. I don't want to do this. And that's what happened with Jonah. What happened with Jonah? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, but the end result, he wound up going. And what happened? He was still angry in his feelings, but God loved him yet still because he knew that Jonah didn't really realize the great purpose. He realized it, but he didn't want to do it. But he got out of Jonah the surrender that he wanted. Here it is that he goes in a rage. A rage means he's violently mad. He wants to slap something. He wants to hit something. And here it is. His servants came near and spake unto him. And see, they got to come and reason with him because they love him. But they also want to let him know. They see, and his servants came and spake unto him and said, my, my father. See, they had to come peaceably. And they had to come in a tone of language that he understood. He said they had to come humbly before him. He said, if the prophet had bid thee or told thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? In other words, wouldn't you have done it? And he probably would have. He said, how much rather than when he, has, when he said to thee, wash and be clean. So he's, he, they're telling him. His servants are saying to him, if he had told you to do some great thing, you would have done it. Why? It's a great thing. But what happens when he tells you to go and wash and be clean? All he's doing is telling you to wash and be clean. In other words, your skin is going to come back and be restored to you. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan. So he listened. He humbled himself and he listened. Ah, thank you, Jesus. See, sometimes you need people to give you an understanding that when you when you're in a stage of your life where you've done something wrong and you thought it was the right thing to do and you keep getting the wrong results have you ever done something over and over and over and you keep trying to get the right result but you keep getting the wrong result sometimes it's because you're unwilling to listen to the voice of reason to give you the right answer at the right time and because you think you know you keep doing it your way. And because you keep doing it your way, you keep getting it wrong every time, beloved. And God is God, God is not trying to keep you at that stage of where you're at and keep you in the place, in the position of not having enough, of not having the success out of life or having the favor of God or having the blessings of God in the full maturity that you should what it is he wants us to humble ourselves and do it his way do you not know when you do it god's way that everything starts aligning and it starts coming together and then you sit back and you think all this time you sit back and think all this time that i missed by doing it my way and i could have done it god's way all along and i couldn't had i could have had my blessing years earlier then years later. Beloved, all God wants to do is to give us his best. The scripture says in St. John 10, he says that he came to might have life and have it more what? Abundantly. That means abundantly to its fullest measure. Beloved, we are missing, you're, we are missing out on so many great things when we don't humble ourselves. And so when this topic came to me, I know that God must have given it because too many times we don't humble ourselves the way that we need to. And humbling yourself does not mean that people get a chance to walk all over you and you, you just let it happen. What it is, is that God wants you to surrender to him and he wants to crucify the flesh part of you that keeps rising up and getting intense and getting into a place of hostility, being angry, cussing people out, being ill-tempered, lack of self-control. He wants you to get to a place where you do it his way instead of your way. That's basically what it is. And how we do it is that we obey the voice of God. When you obey the voice of God, 
everything starts coming in alignment and it works out for your good. To close this out, he humbles himself. He dips himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. His flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he did what? See, now he's humble, and he sees that all it took was obedience. That's all it takes, beloved, obeying the voice of God. So when you humble yourself and obey the voice of God, guess what? You become blessed. You become strengthened. You become empowered. You become favored. Why? Thank you, Jesus, because you're doing it under the obedience of the voice of God. And when you put on the spirit of humility, when you minister in song, when you teach, when you evangelize, when you preach, remember, God is the, he is the master. And so you have to serve what the master has prepared. That means that you have to obey his voice and that you have to wait on the leading the direction of him to give you the instructions. And when he gives you the instructions, obey the instructions. And when you obey those instructions, he'll give you another instructions. When you obey those instructions, he'll give you another instruction. What is he doing? He's teaching you to know the voice of God and what is happening. You're walking in obedience to him and you're walking in what? Humility. That means the power is being produced in you because you're obeying the voice of God by surrendering and yielding yourself to him and doing it just the way he tells you. Beloved, it's not hard. It just takes a person that will walk in humility and humble themselves before God. Here it is. He wants to offer a gift or a present. He says, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But what happens? He says, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And here it is. God heals him because he obeyed and he did not refuse anymore. That's all God wants. He just wants your yes, beloved. He wants your yes. Give him your yes and stop fighting him. It's hard to kick up against the pricks. God loves you and I love you too. I pray that this was a blessing and I pray that it ministered unto you. Remember, just humble yourself. Stop, stop being lifted up in pride and arrogance. Stop thinking that you know you can do it all on your own. Let God help you. Let him send you the help and let him send you the help that he wants and don't refuse it. Till we meet again, beloved. God bless you. Love you to life. Don't forget, like and subscribe. Till we meet again. Bye-bye.